Well, I'm so thankful that it's starting to feel a little bit more like spring. I picked Jonathan up from school the other day, and it was 80 degrees outside. Uh, and he got in the car, and he says, Dad, guess what? I said, what? He says, it feels like baseball season. I said, it does feel like baseball season. And we're getting underway. And in getting underway, there's all kinds of preparations that come into play. He begins to get his arm in shape and all those things. And uh, one of the things that come in consideration at this time, and my wife has, a, has that lecture and talk with me at the beginning of every season. <laughs> and she says to me, swear to me this year you're not going to embarrass me. <laughs> or I'm not going. And so I, I made that solemn swear this year with every intention of just being a good boy and understanding I'm not on the field and I'm not playing and I'm not coaching and I just need to shut my eyes and close my ears. And when it's a horrible call, I'll just go out to the car and go, ah! <laughs> but it reminded me of the story. Uh, it was that first week of the season. Uh, and it's about the second game, and during the game, the coach pulled one of his young players over, a little eight-year-old, and he said, do you understand, son, what cooperation is? Do you understand what a team is? The boy nodded in affirmation. Do you understand that it matters that we play together as a team? Again, the boy nodded yes. So the coach continued, when a strike is called, or you're out at first, or you don't argue, or curse, or attack the umpire, do you understand all of that? Again, the little boy nodded. Good, the coach said. Now go over and explain that to your parents. <laughs> <laughs> We're in Matthew chapter 1, verse number 5. And it says, Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. We've been talking about this. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of King David. Out of this, we understand there's more than a lineage here. There's more than a bloodline. There is a legacy of faith that's been passed down. Men like Boaz, Obed, Jesse, and eventually a giant killer named David. So I'm going to ask you a question before we get into this this morning. Who are you? Uh, where did you come from? Uh, where are you going? What is your destiny today? Because I want you to understand something. I know this for a fact. Legendary faith doesn't just happen. This legacy of faith was created by men and women that not only knew they had faith, but listen to me. More importantly, they knew who they were. So the question this morning is, who are you? Hebrews chapter 2 verse number 11 tells us who we are. And, and you should mark it, underline it, circle it, uh, make a post-it note, put it on the refrigerator to remind yourself all the time, every morning when you awaken, who you are. And it says, so now Jesus and the ones he makes holy. How many of you are one of those ones he's making holy? So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brother's and sisters, wow, that we are the ones being made holy and now we're in this great family of God that Jesus himself, our Lord and Savior and Master, says is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. And so when we understand that faith, quote unquote, is important, I think that even as important as faith or the main component of faith is knowing who you are. That you have this incredible, credible bloodline, a great legacy of faith. And I'm going to tell you something just so you get this. You are somebody. Because I, know, I believe this with all my heart. Knowing who you are creates your destiny. Now, I want to tell you a story. Some of you have heard this before. But the more I get to thinking about it, I, I think, what an incredible story this is. And it's something that happened to me and my dad many years ago. I grew up with a great relationship with my grandparents. They lived in a little 800-square-foot house over on Leland Street there in Houston. 
It, it's the place where I would go and spend lots of time. In fact, when I first started going and visiting my grandparents, they didn't have any air conditioning in the house. Just an attic fan that would suck all the air through the windows and up through the attic. How many of you remember they used to have attic fans? Uh, I'm thankful that we no longer have attic fans. But as I grew older, I asked my dad, because I had such a great relationship with my grandparents, I'd ask him, can, can you tell me a little bit about our genealogy? Who are we? Where did we come from? Uh, you know, that my, I know my name is Robert, and my dad's name, first name is Robert, and my grandfather's first name is Robert. Uh, where did that all come from? How, how did we attain to this name, Robert, and where did it come from? Uh, and he would simply answer, I have no idea. I have no idea where that came from. Not only do I have no idea, all, all we know about our family is that we were sharecroppers here in Texas and we moved from one place to the next and kind of been all over. And he said, you know, your grandfather, uh, that they were, they were down there in South Texas and then they went up to Fort Worth where the work was and went to Beaumont and eventually landed in Harrisburg, Texas. And, and so... I would look at this and I would say, well, that's not much of a legacy. And then my grandfather, if you knew, he was a great man. Uh, he, he put a lot of the formations in my life. I, I mean, uh, he had these fingers. Uh, and when you would do something wrong, he would thump you on the head. Uh, he was big on manners. Uh, and if you didn't affirm and say, yes, sir, or no, sir, or no, ma'am, you, you better look out. You're going to get thumped on the head. Respect was important to him. But he was quite a guy. Uh, he, in fact, he was a character. My wife, we talk about all the time. He was a character. He worked at the same job over 45 years at Hughes Tool. Uh, helped bring in the union there at Hughes Tool. And over the years, he had offers many times to move into management and I was at his deathbed for several days before he died, and he was telling me about the regrets he had in his life. And one of the biggest regrets he had in his life is that, you know, he said, Alan, I could have moved into management, and he said, I could have provided a better living for my family and a better future for my family. But I didn't. I, that always kind of got me on his deathbed that he had this regret, and I started putting two and two together and started asking, you know, well, who are we? And so after my grandparents had died, my dad, because it became so available on the Internet, got on one of those sites and began to do some research and discovered something that is so incredible that you wonder how that story didn't get told. In fact, you wonder how that this, my name Robert, comes from this ancestor whose name was Robert. Uh, and we look at this story, and I think, how do you lose an important story like this over time? Can, can I tell you how you lose important stories? When life becomes so overwhelming and stressful. Come on now. Uh, when, when all of a sudden you're just making it to make it, and all of a sudden... All you can't even see much of a future, and all of a sudden, your past becomes unimportant because your future seems so bleak. So let me read you a little bit about my history, and you're going to say, how in the world did that story not get told? The man's name that was my great-great-great-great-grandfather, five, five generations removed, his name is Lieutenant Robert Rankin. He was a neighbor boy to President George Washington. When George was just a young man living on his father's farm in Virginia, Lieutenant Robert Rankin would carry George's surveyor gear around for George and fetch water for the future president. Later, Robert Rankin served George Washington's army. Then he fought in the American Revolution under General George Washington. He served as guard at the doors during the signing of the Declaration of Independence. When America won the war, Lieutenant Robert Rankin continued his service to America by serving in the House of Representatives for the great state of Virginia. Later, under orders of President Thomas Jefferson, he worked with Sam Houston in the War of 1812, the Spanish-American War. 
He helped to settle in the Louisiana Purchase, and having lived in Alabama and Mississippi and Kentucky, he became a city creator in Kentucky. There is a fort, a county, a city, and a, tank, a, a town named after Lieutenant Robert Rankin. He was solicited by Stephen F. Austin to move to Texas, becoming a part of the Austin 300. He later served under General Sam Houston in the Texas Army, receiving the rank of colonel, and was at the signing of the Mexican Army surrender by President Santa Ana. Lieutenant Robert Rankin spoke five languages. He spoke Spanish, in so telling President Santa Ana to surrender or die in Spanish for General Sam Houston. The general and he were friends, and he lived next to each other in Cold Springs, Texas, just east of Huntsville. Lieutenant Robert Rankin donated his entire property to the city of Cold Springs, creating the city as it is today. Rankin, the Rankin family were dedicated Methodist Christians building the first Methodist church in Texas. The legacy of the Rankins continued with the sons being a part of history and legacy of Texas. Texas historical markers are placed at grave sites and locations throughout Texas, honoring Lieutenant Robert Rankin on historical sites he and his sons have been a part of in Texas. Lieutenant Robert Rankin is only one of two people to have served in three wars in Texas, starting at the American Revolution, the Spanish-American War of 1812, and the Texas Independence War. Uh, he was later honored by uh, our, our uh, governor, uh, last time being Rick Perry. Uh, he was the last political servant to honor him with a speech and a plaque at his gravesite there in Austin. You know, I, I read that, and I am amazed that here as a young boy, I can ask my dad a question, where do we come from? And he has no idea. How do you, listen to me, how do you lose a story like that? That your great, great, great grandfather was a boyhood friend of George Washington. I mean, how do you forget that? That he's at the battle of San Jacinto as an interpreter for Sam Houston. How do you not know stuff like that? Your name, Robert, comes from this guy. And I've thought oftentimes, somewhere along the way, my grandfather didn't know about this stuff. And I just wonder, this is what I wonder. I wonder, had he known his lineage, his heritage, where he came from, if he might have been different and made different decisions in his life. Or that he would always think of himself as the son of a sharecropper. That couldn't attain to anything. That was nothing more than just a worker. Couldn't even, couldn't even make the decision to go into management. And we understand something because I want, I want to convince you of something today. That you have a legacy and you are destined for greatness. You have a legacy and you are destined for greatness. But I want you to understand something. Your destiny is always threatened at crossroads. And those crossroads are crossroads of difficulty. Because difficulty will either enable you to carry on the story, or listen to me, that story will die with your generation. Amen. So we're going to read a story, and we're going to read about David. If you have your Bible, uh, we've, been, we've been reading about his legacy and his legacy of faith. We're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 30. But before we go there, I've got to give you a little bit of background so you can understand what's going on here. So you can get the whole picture. Of course, David is a legendary figure in Israel. He was a warrior unlike any before him. He's a giant killer. But for eight years, as we come into this story, he has been a fugitive. Eight long years he's been looking over his shoulder. Four of those years he was in the wilderness as Saul chased him through the wilderness. For the last four of these years, he, he's in Philistine territory under a Philistine king named Achish of Gath. And as he's in his Philistine territory, he goes out and he raids the Amalekites. And he raids all the foreign dignitaries around. Uh, and he brings all the bounty back and brings some to Achish. And as Achish asks him, uh, David tells him this. He says, we're going into Judah to the people of God and we're stealing from them. 
And so Achish believes that David is very dedicated to him and not so dedicated to Israel. So one day, it's the springtime and it's the time for kings to go into war and the Philistines are marching into battle against the Israelites. And Achish asked David to come join him. So David and his 600 mighty men join with King Achish as they are about to march into battle against Israel. So now let's stop for just a moment because this is an important part of the story. Here is David, and most all of his men have some type of Hebrew relationship. Yes, some of them are foreigners, but most of them come from Judah. They come from Israel, and they understand that their God is a covenant God. Can you imagine as they're walking and marching into this formation behind Achish, about to go into war, the thoughts that are going through these men's mind? What in the world are we doing? How are we following this guy? We're about to go into battle against our friends and neighbors and dearest relatives. Does this man expect us to follow him into battle against our own kinsmen? Imagine those thoughts. Now, I'm going to say this, and you need to get it. I'm so thankful that we have a God that intervenes on our behalf sometimes. He is rich in grace and mercy because all of a sudden Achish is marching up and they're joining the formation. And the other kings look back at David and his 600 men and say, whoa, 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 whoa. hold on, what, what is this? And he said, well, that's David. He's proven himself over the last four years to being faithful to me. In fact, he brings me spoils that he goes out and he raids Israel. They say, hold on just a second. Have you not been around any of these Hebrews? This is what they, have you not been around? They all sing songs about this guy. That he is the warrior among warriors. That he's not just killed the thousands. He's killed the tens of thousands. He, he, he has taken our greatest hero and knocked him down and killed him. And so they said, there's no way that you're allowing this man to go in war with us today. And so they have marched four days to get where they are. And so now they're going to have to march four days back to home at a little village. That's where we pick up the story. First Samuel Chapter 30. Three days later, when David and his men arrived home at their town of Ziklag, they found that the Amalekites had made a raid into Negev and Ziklag. Let's stop here for just a moment. The Amalekites aren't great warriors. I just need to put that out so everybody understands that. Uh, they, they are... Pest. They are cowards. Uh, and they like to take advantage when there aren't any fighting men in the village so they can come and rape and plunder and take. They're thieves. But if you'll go back in earlier in 1 Samuel, you'll remember the story of King Saul when he comes into power. And God says to him, go, and I have a long memory. The Amalekites have done great damage to us. It's been 100 years removed, but God says, I want you to go and destroy all the Amalekites. And Saul doesn't do it. And here they are again coming up in the story. You say, Pastor, why is that important in this story? Can I tell you something? You think that you can manage your sin. Come on now. You think you can take and manage your sin. You think that you've got it all under control. Can I tell you, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and he'll come back and steal what you don't, what you don't want him to. So here are the Malachites, and they've come. It says they had crushed Ziglag and burned it to the ground. They had carried off the women and children and everyone else, but without killing anyone. When David and his men saw the ruins and realized what had happened to their families, they wept until they could weep no more. Can I ask you a question? Anybody ever been here where you have wept until you can weep no more? Anybody ever been in that position where you wept until you could weep 
no more. David's two wives, Hananoam from Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal from Carmel, were among those captured. Now, now David was in great danger because all, everybody say all, all his men, 600 strong, were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters, and they began to talk of stoning him. But the latter part of the scripture is important. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Then he said to Abiathar the priest, bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought it. Then David asked the Lord, should I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? And the Lord told him, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. And what this, what this part of the scripture doesn't tell you is that he does. And he doesn't just recover what was taken. He recovers much, much, much more. This, of course... I want us to understand how important this story is at this crossroads. This is a day of destiny. It is the last major test before David comes into the kingdom. This is the final test. We get the picture that these men, that they are not exactly bought into David's leadership now. That they have marched for eight days solid and marched back. And had they not marched with the Philistines, that their families, their, 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 their people, all of their flocks would still be there. And in the midst of this situation, it says that David found strength in the Lord. Now, I want us to understand about this crossroads because many of you may be at this crossroads. The crossroads is where legacies die. Many good Christians, I mean good Christian people, lose their legacy at similar crossroads. But it says of David, David found strength in the Lord his God. How did David find this strength? And can we discover it in Scripture? We can, and we're going to. See, we ask the question, was it in his bloodline? Sure it was. Had he heard the stories about Boaz, oh, man, more than you. Had he heard the stories about Rahab the harlot that's in his blood, he'd heard all those stories. But how many of you know that sometimes when you're in the midst of the present, the past seems like a long ways away? Now, come on now, that, that is really weak. How many know when you're overwhelmed... When you're overwhelmed and you don't know what to do, it's more like this with God. What have you done for me lately? I mean, we could talk about the days of old. We could talk about healings. We could talk about uh, how God delivered. We could talk about all those things, but it just seems, oh, I don't feel like talking about those things. <laughs> and our feelings kind of overwhelm us. But there's some important things in this story that we've got together because there's a little secret to be found in this story. How did David find his strength? You say, well, it's, he didn't only had faith, but Pastor Allen, David knew who he was. Those 600 men may not have known who they were, but David knew who he was. He has, listen to me, he has been in the wilderness eight years. How many of you would complain after one? He is being chased and his life threatened for eight years. And these 600 men have followed him for eight years. Now they come home and everything is gone after eight years of suffering. Huh. Everybody want to know the natural because I know it real well. I think it's time to throw in the towel. I must have done something. I must have made God mad. He must not like me very much. Eight years. That's a long time. 
Uh, eight years, everybody in the church wonders if you're not cursed. Come on now. You come to church and everybody says, eight years, man, there must be something desperately wrong in your life. And you come to the front and they say, we've got to find the sin. There's no sin in David's life. There's no sin in his life. Eight years in the wilderness, he suffered. And now he's at a crossroads where most of us, and probably including myself, would have said, okay, that's it. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, you anointed me and Samuel came to the house, and yeah, I killed the giant. That was a long time ago. <laughs> but, but here I am, and I've done everything I can to serve you, and this is how you reward me. I come home after doing what you want me to do and running from this guy and honoring this man of God when I could have killed him numerous times and I haven't done any of that stuff and here I am and look at what you've done to me. Don't act like you haven't thought it. And we come to Psalm 18. Oh, you need to open Psalm 18. We come to Psalm 18 and in my heading, this is what it says. For the choir director, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord. He sang this song to the Lord on the day the Lord rescued him from all his enemies and from Saul. And this is what he sang. I love you, Lord. You are my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my savior. My, my God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. I called on the Lord who is worthy of praise, and he saved me from my enemies. The ropes of death entangled me. Floods of destruction swept over me. The grave wrapped its ropes around me. Death laid a trap in my path. But in my distress, I cried out to the Lord. Yes, I prayed to my God for help, and he heard me from his sanctuary. My cry to him reached his ears. Then the earth quaked and trembled. The foundations of the mountains shook. They, they quaked because of his anger. Smoke poured from his nostrils. Fierce flames leaped from his mouth. Glowing coals blazed forth from him. He opened the heavens and came down. Dark storm clouds were beneath his feet. Mounted on a mighty angelic being, he flew soaring on the wings of the wind. He shrouded himself in darkness, veiling his approach with dark rain clouds. Thick clouds shielded the brightness around him and rained down hail and burning coals. The Lord thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High resounded amid the hail and burning coals. He shot his arrows and scattered his enemies. Great bolts of lightning flashed and they were confused. Then that's your command, O Lord. At the blast of your breath, the bottom of the sea could be seen, and the foundations of the earth were laid bare. He reached down from heaven and rescued me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemies, from those who hated me and were too strong for me. They attacked me at a moment when I was in distress. Does that sound familiar? They attacked me in a moment when I was in distress, but the Lord supported me. Now, here's the key, verse number 19. If you've heard in all this reading, you say, where are you going? Here it is in voice number 19. He led me to a place of safety. He rescued me because he delights in me. Hold on just a second. <laughs> are we reading about the same guy? That here he is, that everybody else is ready to stone him because all they can see is trouble for eight years. And here is a guy who finds strength in the Lord. And you say, Pastor, how does he find in the strength of the Lord? Because he knows he's different from everybody else. He's not the same as them. He doesn't have the same mindset. He understands he is a man of destiny, that God has ordered his steps. And he knows that God delights in him. And so while everybody else is complaining and weeping till they can weep no more, including him, he has lost everything. It says that David finds his strength in the Lord as God because he knows something that nobody else knows. 
He's special. He's called. He's destined. And yes, he can act like everybody else if he wanted to. And listen to me. His legacy would have been lost at the crossroads. His story would have ended right there. The story of all stories about a shepherd boy who becomes a king would have ended at a little town called Ziklag because David all of a sudden became like everybody else. But he writes, he led me to a place of safety. He rescued me because he delights in me. So I'm going to ask you a question. Do you need to catch this today? Was David a perfect man? I, I just told you, no, he's not a perfect man. He, he's been lying to King Achish. He's not a perfect man. He's fearful. I mean, he's been chased in the wilderness for He is not a perfect man. But there's something different about him. What made David so different? David knew who he was to God. Listen to me because this is an important point today. He didn't listen to the lies about himself to shake that faith and confidence. Now, we've read this in the last couple of weeks, and you should know it. Revelation 12.10, it says of the, of the enemy, the devil, it says that he is the accuser of the brothers and sisters. It says that he's accusing in heaven, but can I tell you something? He doesn't just accuse in heaven. He comes to earth. He comes to church on Sunday mornings. He comes to church as you're thinking, I really ought to praise the Lord. And he says, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> Who do you think you are? I mean, don't you remember what you were doing just yesterday? Now, don't you remember how you cussed out your husband before you left for church this morning? Who do you think you are at church acting all holy and righteous? Anybody here ever encountered the accuser? Come on now, I need more hands than that. Anybody here ever encountered the accuser? You're not alone. Jesus comes into his public ministry. Fast for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. There he is. And at the end of the fast, the enemy comes. The accuser. Not because he's testing to see who Jesus is, because he knows who Jesus is. Come on now. He's testing to see if Jesus knows who he is. You see, the enemy comes and he accuses you and he tells you lies not to test, not to test that you're not a child of God, but he wants to know that you know that you're a child of God because that's the most dangerous part that you can be when you say, man, I'm a child of God. When you can become like David in the midst of the circumstances, it looks really bad here, but I've got good news. Uh, he still delights in me. Yeah, I've been chased for eight years. But guess what? He still delights in me. Bring me the ephod. We're going after them jokers. See, the devil wants to steal from us because he is an accuser. And I'm going to tell you something. We could sit here all morning long and talk about faith. And we become a people oftentimes that our faith is circumstantial. When we have a crisis, we say, well, we better muster up or we better find somebody who has some faith. Okay, can I tell you something? When you know who you are, you don't have to muster up anything. You don't have to say, well, let's really get into that. No, you know who you are. And so this morning, for just a few moments, before we close, I want you to get reacquainted with the real you. 
So I'm going to ask a question. You don't have to raise your hand right now. But you can just affirm. How many of you have asked Jesus Christ to come into your life for him to be your Lord and Master? You, you, you've done that. Listen to what Galatians says about you. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Can, can I stop here for just a moment? I, I want us to understand, when you understand who you are in Christ it is your main identity. You're not a guy who works at a plant that is a Christian. I mean, it's one of the things that drives me crazy of some of the articles that I read in modern Christianity that these people write that their identity is, oh, well, I'm transgender. I'm a transgender Christian. Can I tell you something? There is no such thing. And I'm not just talking about transgender. You've lost your identity in Christ. You are a Christian before you're anything else. That's what he's saying here. You're, you're not Jew or Gentile. You're not slave or male or female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. And now you belong to Christ. The Word of God says you are his prized possession. I walked out of my office today, and this is how I prayed. I'll let you know. I said, God, preaching today is going to be easy. Because these people are your prized possession. You value them above anything on planet Earth. There's not anything you value more than your kids. So what you have me to say, to, it ain't go, there ain't, there's not going to be any problems because you've got something to say today. And it says that now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs. And God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. You see, you are somebody that when you read and you read about all these great people, Hebrews brings it so together there in the latter part of Hebrews chapter 11. He says, these are the people the Abrahams and the Moses, and we're disconnecting because we think, what great people of faith. And I even had a guy tell me one day, uh, he said, well, I'm no Abraham. Can, can I tell you something? You may be a lot more like Abraham than you think you are. What separated Abraham? Was he a perfect man? Did he make mistakes? Was he fearful and afraid and lied? But God spoke to him, and he knew who he was. So the Word of God says, in spite of all that, he was looking for a land that didn't exist here. He was looking for a city. And you understand something. Now the Word of God says that we are his heirs. That we are in his bloodline. That all of those that have gone before us, you can think of yourself as a nobody, but I'm going to tell you something, you're not a Christian. Because there aren't Christians who are nobodies. That's the word of God. There are no nobodies in the kingdom of God. Everybody is a masterpiece called by Christ, redeemed by his blood. So you understand you can be at a crossroads today. And you can start it all and be like the 600. Let's get out of here and do something different. We're just forsaken. <laughs> this guy's cursed. We've done this for eight years and now we've lost everything. We have nothing to show for it. But hang on. Within a year, within two years... David is going to wear a crown on his head and every one of those 600 men are going to be rewarded beyond belief. Wow. 
can I ask you a question? It may be dark, but maybe your breakthrough is just right around the corner. Maybe you're at the crossroads and maybe you want to quit. But maybe it's just right around the corner. And maybe God is just waiting for you to stand up and say, You delight in me. <laughs> Everybody else says, Yeah, I don't get it. Well, you may not get it. That's okay. <laughs> but that incredible story that I told you about Lieutenant Robert Rankin, nobody in our family knew. How do you lose a story like that? Amen. The same way you lose your story at the crossroads. That you've killed giants in the past. God has healed you. He has touched you. He has redeemed you. But all of a sudden you feel cursed. And you're going to make a turn. Listen to me. And you're going to lose your story for you. And you're going to lose your story for your kids. So I think it's vital that we reacquaint ourselves with who we are. So here's some quick steps. You ready? We're going we're to wrap it up. Number one. Know your story. What is my story? I was a sinner bound for hell. I could do nothing to get myself any different. And Christ bought me with a high price and redeemed me. I'm going to tell you that it, this is my story. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Listen to me. You need to know your story. Story Number two is you need to tell your story. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's easy to complain. But you know what? You don't need to complain. You don't need to complain. Listen, this world's full of trouble and everybody's going through it. You say, Pastor, but this seems like it's really fresh to you. It is really fresh to me. I mean, we've had, Shelly, Pastor Shelly and I, we had one thing after another thing after another thing. Pastor Glenn says, I, I, just don't, I, I don't even know how that could happen. I mean, our house gets messed up during the storm. So we got it all back together, got the new roof on. And this week, the sewer backs up. And we're out of our house for four days. Yeah. So on Tuesday, I'll be honest with you. Pastor Shelley and I forgot who we were. We didn't like the world. I mean, we didn't, we didn't want to talk about it. We didn't want to talk to each other. We wouldn't say, where is God? I mean, we pastored Life in New Church 25 years, and it's one thing after another. You need to change your story. You need to remember who you are. Because number three is this. Don't believe the lies. Cindy Palazzolo is going to come and do a thing for our women. For those of you who don't know, Dr. Rich and Cindy have been beneficial to our family because uh, they have helped us, counseled us. Um, talked with us. And one of the big things that they do in their ministry is this, is that it's not traditional counseling, it's biblical counseling that comes to a place that says, you're believing a lie about yourself. This is what the Word of God says about you, but this is what you're believing about yourself. The Word, you know, that the, in modern, modern understanding, the, the American woman, almost 90% of American women, most of them believe they're bad moms. Can I tell you something? That's a lie. The devil wants to beat you down and have you believe something about yourself. And sometimes you have to understand this is a lie. I, I am a masterpiece by God. I'm not talking about being, being prideful and arrogant, but I'm talking about being confident in who you are in him because something's different because you're different. Can I tell you something? When you know who you are, yes, you're going to mess up, but you're going to stay on the right road. Yeah, that's right, that's right. When you don't know who you are, you're going to veer everywhere across the road and go anywhere you want to do. 
And that's where we are in the American church because most people don't know who they are as Christians. They have no idea. They don't have a story. They're not telling their story, and they believe the lie. They come to church, and they say, well, you can't be one of those fanatics, and you can't be that, or you can't be this, and you can't raise your hand, you can't tithe, and you can't do all. I mean, you start believing the lies, and all of a sudden, you walk out of this place and say, well, I like how it feels to go to church, but I could never be one of those people. And I'm going to tell you something. God has a destiny for you, and you're missing it. He has a big destiny for you, and you're missing it because you're believing the lie. Don't believe the lies. Number four, your difficulty will reveal your destiny. Eight years in the wilderness. Listen to me. You may be one crossroads from your kingdom destiny. One crossroads away. Imagine had David joined the 600 at Ziklag. It's been too long. I'm done. I quit. It would have been someone with great potential that was once a giant, giant killer that was ordained to be a king, never became a king because he quit at Ziklag. You may be in your Ziklag today, but I want to remind you of who you are. Somebody say amen. amen. Will you bow your heads with me? If you're here today, and you can be honest, this is church. There's no better place to be honest than here and say, Pastor Allen, I do not have a relationship with God. I believed one too many lies. I don't have a relationship with God. The enemy has come and he's stolen from me. And I have lost my story. I've lost my story. But today, I want to reacquaint myself and recapture my story. If that's you, will you raise your hand so I can pray for you right where you're at today? You say, I'm going to recapture my story today. Raise your hand high because you say, I'm going to recapture my story today. I'm going to recapture my story today. It's going to be my story. I'm going to be that overcomer. I'm going to be that called one of God. I'm going to fulfill the destiny that God has for me today. Father, I pray over every uplifted hand right now, people who love you, that want to follow you with all their heart. Lord, that the enemy whispers in their ear all the time. You could, can't do it. Even as I'm speaking right now, he's talking to them and saying, you're joking. You've tried this a million times and you can't do it. Devil, you're a liar today. Get out of here. You're a liar today. Lord, we receive who we are in you. That we are precious. We are called. We are redeemed. We are holy because you make us holy. We're righteous because you make us righteous. We are created and made in your image to live with you forever and ever and ever. We are your children today. And we declare ourselves as being such. We thank you, Lord that we are special and we leave this place special today. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me today.